Welcome back to another Swordmaster Publications presentation. My name is Ernie Lawrence. Today we're going to be looking at Deuteronomy chapter 34. It's the last chapter of the book. There's not really a lot of uh, deep, intense stuff in this chapter. We're not going to be looking forward to the New Testament or anything like that. But we are going to be wrapping up the life of Moses and the uh, books of law that he delivered to them during their wandering in the wilderness before they go into the promised land. So let's get started. Verse 1, And Moses went up from the plains of Moab unto the mountain of Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, that is over against Jericho. And Jehovah showed him all the land of Gilead unto Dan, and all Naphtali, and the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, and all the land of Judah unto the utmost sea. And the south, and the plain of the valley of Jericho, the, palm, the city of palm trees, unto Zoar. So Moses goes up to the top of this mountain, uh, the mountain of Nebo, the top of Pisgah, uh, which is uh, like right at the highest point in the entire area where they're at. Looking out, he can see from this point all the way to the Mediterranean Sea, all the way to the north and south of the land of Canaan. He sees Jericho down below, which is the city that they would first come against in uh, the book of Joshua. Uh, sees all the way down to Zoar, which if you remember uh, was... Uh, there in the time of Lot, um, the uh, one of the five cities uh, of that uh, region. And so verse 4, Jehovah said unto him, This is the land which I swear unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, saying, I will give it unto thy seed. I have caused thee to see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not go over there. So God is saying, Look, I'm about to fulfill my promise. You brought them out of Egypt to this point know that I'm going to fulfill my promise. And so Moses, the servant of Jehovah, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of Jehovah. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, over against Beth Peor. But no man knows of his sepulcher unto this day. So God buries him. God, he, Moses dies. Um, he uh, de Definitely we have recorded that Moses uh, committed sins. Unlike uh, Enoch, we don't we don't have anything about Enoch committing any sins, but we do have that Moses did, and so Moses does die, and uh, God is the one that personally buries him, <clears throat> and it says in the land of Moab over against Beth Peor, so he doesn't get to be buried in the land of Canaan, um, although he is uh, buried in the land that was given to uh, the two tribes that uh, stayed on this side of the Jordan. It says over against Beth Peor, but we don't know where his sepulcher is today. We don't know where Moses' body lies to this day. And it's interesting to look at this because when we see this phrase, and we'll see another one down below, the way that this is written, it's written to speak to the Israelites all the way through their entire history. So even though Joshua is writing this right before they go into the land of Canaan, uh, the way that he writes this is if somebody's reading this in the time of Christ, they're going to read that and say, unto this day, wow, we, 1,500 years later, we, we don't know where Moses' body is buried. And so it's a very interesting uh, insight into <clears throat> the omniscience of God. It's a, uh, a prophetic look. We're not... We're not uh, seeing a book that was written hundreds of years after the fact. This is being written by Joshua before they go into the land of promise. But the way that he's writing it, he's inspired as uh, uh, all the inspired writers were by the Holy Spirit. And so from the human standpoint, this is proleptic. This is um, something that is accomplished uh, way in the future, but it's written as, uh, as if it was... Uh, or it's, it's written as if it was already accomplished, even though uh, we're here right at the moment or the time that it, it was uh, first being talked about. And so <clears throat> what we're seeing here is that divine perspective, that omniscience of God, and the way that he's communicating to mankind. He's giving us a glimpse of the divine perspective rather than just the human one. So I, f I find phrases like this to be very interesting because we know when they were written and we know what they're written about, and um, we we have to understand them. There's no other way to understand it except for that, that divine perspective or that proleptic look at things. 
It says, uh, verse 7, Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. In other words, Moses, remember, Moses spent 40 years in Egypt, 40 years living his best life um, under Jethro and and, in Midian and and, uh, marrying Zipporah and all of that, and then 40 years leading the Israelites out of Egypt through the wilderness to this point. And it says his eye was not dim. He he was, even though he was chronologically very old, he was very fit, very healthy. Um, he wasn't dying of old age. He wasn't dying of disease. He wasn't dying of like a cancer or anything like that. Um, he was fully himself. God had preserved him like he had preserved their clothing, had preserved uh, the, the nation. God had preserved Moses, and he was in his full health when he went up on that mountain. And then he dies there. And um, it's an interesting way to go. You know, uh, a lot of people will think about or talk about how they would like to go. Um, In the ancient times, or maybe even today, uh, soldiers talk about wanting to go out... um, defending their homes and, and uh, fighting for what they believe in. Or somebody might say, I would like to die in my old age in my sleep or whatever. So we think about these things. But imagine being vibrant, full of life, completely healthy. And then God says, today you're going to die. And imagine Moses just kind of sitting there looking around and then he's not alive anymore. And then God buries his body. So uh, it's it's just an interesting thing to think about for me. Uh, I don't know if it is for anyone else. And then it says, The children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab for 30 days. So the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. So there's this time period where uh, these these people who had been led by this man to the brink of God's promise, they they realize all that Moses had done for them, all that God had done for them through Moses. And... <clears throat> They recognize what a great leader that Moses was, uh, the first king, as we read about in the last chapter. Um, And he was beloved at the end of his life. Now, there was a lot of murmuring and complaining along the way. But at this point in time, uh, Israel does indeed love Moses. And um, if there's any kind of look to the future uh, in this, any kind of prophetic look is looking to Jesus as the anti-type of Moses. Jesus was not all that well beloved while he was on earth. There were people that did love him, but but he wasn't all that well loved when he was on earth. But after he dies, is buried, rises again and becomes king, how many people come to love him after the fact? And so I, I, I kind of see that. That's, that's probably not a... Um, an absolute reference that the Bible is intending to make. I don't know, um, but I do see that connection here. Uh, But he was well-beloved, and so they mourned for him for 30 days. And then that time period is ended, and then it says, The Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him. That idea of laying the hands on is uh, that I'm I'm giving my uh, sign of authority, I'm giving my approval, that Joshua is indeed going to be my successor. He's going to be the one to lead the people into the promised land. And it says he was full of the spirit of wisdom. Um, That idea here, that spirit, doesn't always refer to the Holy Spirit. And uh, it also doesn't necessarily refer to spirit in the sense of the essence or being of a person. We're not talking about Joshua's soul, his spirit, that spiritual aspect of himself that's created in the image of God. <clears throat> and we're not talking about the Holy Spirit. We're talking about an air, uh, a, a way of being. And just like, you know, we talk about the spirit of St. Louis or, uh, you know, I've got the spirit of my grandfather in me or something along those lines. Um, the spirit of wisdom just means that uh, Joshua was full of wisdom, having been at the feet of Moses, his assistant, for 40 years, he was his his protege. He was the one that had uh, learned all that Moses had to teach him. And so that's that's what this is saying here, is that Joshua is indeed the uh, uh, true successor of Moses. 
and follows after him. And the children of Israel hearkened unto him. They listened to Joshua. Now, that's, that's kind of funny in a way because when you read about the Israelites moving through uh, from Exodus to this point, the Israelites didn't always listen to Moses. And they caused a lot of problems. But at this point, it, the children of Israel listened to him. This generation is a generation of obedient followers of God. They are, they are the children of the first generation that came out of Egypt. They are uh, the ones who saw the good and the bad. They recognized the power of God. They saw it firsthand. And so they, they love Moses. They mourn for his passing, but they also listen to Joshua. And so this is, you might think of this as, as the best generation. We talk about in, in America the uh, the generation that was alive during World War II or whatever, and how uh, that was the great generation for America. And there there have been several, uh, I would say, in American history, but um, in Israelite history, this is one of those generations that's the great generation because of their desire to follow after God and to listen to His servants. And it says that they listened, they hearkened unto Joshua and did as Jehovah commanded Moses. They, they obeyed. They followed his commands. They did what they were supposed to do. And then <clears throat> here's another one of those uh, that is a, one of those phrases where, yeah, um, we're right here. Moses has just died. But the way that it's phrased is for the purposes of somebody reading this tens, hundreds, 1500 years down the road looking to uh, the the way that uh, God sees time. It says, And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, who Jehovah knew face to face. And so even though <clears throat> there hasn't really been time for that, you know, Joshua just took over, um, it says there's not a, not a prophet since. And, and all of the time that Israel is going to be a nation, and the interesting part of that is, is that it does show that Israel has an end. That that from the time that Israel began to the time that Israel end, no other prophet would ever be like Moses, um, in the sense of Moses, who Jehovah knew face to face. Now, here's the interesting thing about that: Moses is a type of Christ. Christ was the anti-type of Moses, and in that sense, he was a prophet, he was a shepherd, he was a king, all of the things that Moses was, but better, but he is Jehovah, he is God, and so this, this isn't about a prophet that knew God, and, and that's not a violation of this verse. This is this is Jesus would be a prophet that is God, and so does not fit the idea of a prophet that knows God as a friend face to face. That there's a there's a difference, a distinction between Jesus being the antitype with Moses. So Moses was just a friend of God. <clears throat> Jesus Christ, as we have seen multiple times in these books, is indeed God. And so there's, there's an important distinction there, but I just like these, I just like these phrases. I like the way that it has a looking forward. And so somebody reading this in, uh, the time of Uzziah or Hezekiah or, uh, in the time of Daniel or in uh, the time of Ezra and Nehemiah or the intertestamental period or all of those, they can read these and this statement will still be true. And God, in his omniscience, knows that. And so he has Joshua write this so that anybody and everybody reading this will say, yeah, nobody since Moses has come up that's anywhere close to being like him. And it's just powerful to me. <clears throat> in verse 11, And all the signs and wonders which Jehovah sent him to do in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh, and to all his servants, and to all his land, and in all the mighty hand and all the great terror which Moses showed in the sight of Israel. And I like this. Moses is the friend of God. This, this, is, this is the statement here. You, you, you have this in verse 10. You have this early up here talking about Moses right before he, he dies. Moses is the friend of God and knew God face to face. Now, first of all, let's talk about the idea that nobody has seen the Father face to face. Right? The idea is you... you cannot see the father face to face. So who does Moses indeed know in terms of personage? 
it's God the Son. That's that's who is the friend of Moses. Uh, Moses is is the friend of of God the Son uh, in a person kind of level. But even though we know that God is the ultimate source of all of these great things that have happened, these great and terrible things that have happened, God gives Moses credit for those. God says that that Moses is the one that did them. And all the signs and wonders which Jehovah sent him to do, and in all the mighty hand and all the great terror which Moses showed. And so there's this... This idea, you know, when, when I say that, uh, when you look at the New Testament, you look at the miracles, and I say that, well, um, Paul was able to perform miracles, or the apostles would lay hands on people, and most people had the ability to do miracles. And somebody will always come back and say, well, no, it's God actually doing the miracles. Mankind doesn't have the ability to do miracles. That's not the way the Bible puts it. When God empowers us to do things... He gives us the ability to do things. And then God is the one that gives us the credit because we make the choices to follow after God and do as he commands and use those gifts, those abilities that he has given us to complete his work. So this isn't about boasting. This isn't about saying I'm some great thing. But this is... Uh, another sign of God giving us free will, the ability to choose these things. Because if we were to say, well, God did all of these things and Moses was just some kind of a puppet or some kind of a robot, uh, some kind of a channel that God worked through, like the Calvinist might teach, then um, we, we strip away the idea of free will and man gets zero credit at all uh, in God's eyes. But God, God is the one here giving Moses credit for doing these things that he enabled him to do. Of course, God gets all of the the ultimate glory. God gets all of the ultimate credit. But Moses made the choice to follow after God. And God is not adverse to giving him the the amount of credit that Moses uh, does indeed deserve for choosing to follow God. A lot of people will come at me and say, you believe works are necessary for salvation. And you want to boast about this and you want to, and they just, they go on and on. And and the framing of it is of course terrible. They don't understand the position at all, but uh, God did indeed create us with free will. And God did give us the ability to choose him or not him, even in our sin, even when we are lost, God created us in his image. Our spirit has the ability to seek after, to understand, and to choose God. That's what Romans 6.16 is all about. You yield yourself to the master that you want to serve. And then when you make that choice, you get the credit or the blame for making that choice. And God has no problem assigning credit or blame. You are responsible for your sin. You get the blame for your sin. You're responsible for your righteousness. You get the blame for your righteousness. And that's not something to boast about because it's God who does the enabling. But you bear the consequences of your choice. You bear the responsibility for good or ill. And I think that this this is the most practical thing in this chapter for me <clears throat> is seeing God give Moses the credit for the things that Moses chose to do with the abilities that God enabled him to do. And um, just honestly, this is a good place to come if somebody says, well, um, God gets all of the credit for everything that you do, especially Calvin is saying, you get all, God gets all the credit whether you sin or whether you do righteousness, it's all God. Well, God is the one giving Moses credit for the choices that he made, for good or for ill. I mean, he died, he didn't get to go in the promised land. Moses owns that. But Moses did all these great things. He owns that too. And God acknowledges that and gives him credit for it. God is, God is not a, a God who is so absolutely narcissistic that he is unable to say, good job, you did well. Because we see that in, um, in the New Testament. Enter in 
Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Who gets the credit for that? The servant does. And God has no problems with saying that. He, he's not narcissistic at all. He gave us free will. And those things, those statements, this statement here at the end of Deuteronomy, those statements in the New Testament make no sense at all if man has no free will. So, anyway, uh, this wraps up Deuteronomy chapter 34. This also wraps up the book of Deuteronomy. Um, <clears throat> I think I might take a break from doing these verse-by-verse -verse, uh, studies. Um, the next series would be looking through the books of history. Probably going to try to do those in a, a more chronological fashion, um, especially since First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles cover the same material, I probably will pre prepare um, a, a document that's more of a parallel history document rather than coming here to Bible Gateway and just reading it straight up. Um, so I might not do them in the order that the Bible presents them, uh, or at least the way that they're arranged, but um, I also probably am going to take a break from that and do more uh, topical studies, maybe doing some lessons from the written stuff that I have on my website or something along those lines. I do really appreciate you joining me for this journey through the first five books of the Old Testament. And uh, as always, I look forward to those questions that you guys have for me. Um, I wish you guys the very best in your own studies, and uh, I look forward to doing more studies with you. So my name is Ernie Lawrence. This has been another Swordmaster Publications presentation. Y'all have a wonderful day.